Hello and welcome to another edition of Sun Dragon Tips and Tricks. I'm Rebecca. I'm the owner of Sun Dragon Art and Fiber in downtown Brevard, North Carolina. Today I thought we might try a little bit of stranded color work. I am imagining, as I knock my needles over, <laughs> I'm imagining that this may turn out to be kind of a long video because I'd like to go over some different ways you can do it holding your um, the yarn in your hands. We're talking about two yarns that both travel across the work as you go. Stranded color work. Now sometimes people call this Fair Isle, but it's all, all Fair Isle is stranded color work, but not all stranded color work is Fair Isle. Anyway, there's more technicalities to it than I know about. I'm speaking from my limited experience. There, I am an English style knitter, which means I hold my yarn in my right hand. And I can do stranded color work where I'm holding it with two different hands, one continental, one English. If you are a continental knitter, there are ways to do this, holding it in one hand. We may not go over that in this video. I'm gonna be addressing more two stranded, two hands, or if you're an English style knitter, what you can do. If I can, I'll try to mark places where with the live doing it with this yarn, I try different techniques for you. Otherwise, just enjoy the video, you know, relax, check some of it out. I'm doing my best to map it out with pictures too, with drawings, we'll see how that goes. Come along with the adventure. Let's get to it. So I should have mentioned in the little intro part, we are talking about two color knit stranded color work in this video. Purling takes a lot of the same conceptual ideas, but we are not going to tackle cur um, <laughs> curling. We're not going to tackle purling in this video because it's already probably going to be long enough. I recommend if it's your first project, you may want to try a hat or mittens or something that is in, a, in the round so you don't have to worry about purling so much because you're always on the outside of the work. So I mentioned in the intro, sometimes this is referred to as Fair Isle knitting. Now Fair Isle tends to talk about a really specific style of, of stranded color work. And so if we had to do like a Venn diagram and we said, here is stranded color work. So this whole thing is stranded color work. It wouldn't be necessarily be an overlapping one. It would be like all Fair Isle. This is the Fair Isle. All Fair Isle is technically stranded color work, but not all stranded color work would most people call Fair Isle. Sometimes people just use the words interchangeably. I'm cool with either, but I know there are some people who are really technical out there and they may even have issue with some of what I'm going to tell you Everyone's got their own ideas about how they like to do things, and I'm just sharing mine. So, let's go over some of the basics. What we're really looking at, and we're, let me back back up and say, we're looking at two color stranded color work. You can have more than two. You can have tons. Two is a good place to start, and a lot of classic patterns will only have two to keep things a little simpler. But what we're talking about is both colors are used in the row. Now, we've talked in the sideshow about how mosaic as a technique is knitting with one and slipping stitches of the other color to give you the same effect. Right now, we are talking about both colors are going to travel across the row. One is going to float behind the other as you go, so that's why they're called floats often. People talk about keeping your floats loose. If you knit two stitches with one color and then two stitches with another and then yank to keep your tension to do the next stitches in the first color, you're gonna end up with a really puckery piece of fabric that may or may not be helped by blocking. Especially if you have long sections with one color and then a single stitch in your second color, if your floats are tight, if they jam up, they might pull that stitch so you don't even see it. So keep your floats loose. There are a couple of ways to do this that I would recommend. 
one would be really uh, try not to think about gauge so much. So don't stress about tension. or gauge. Try not to stress about that and pull real tight all the time. The other thing, if you're doing a sweater or something, often when there's longer passes between them, your, your tension will take care of itself on the actual stitches. The other thing that I picked up from a knitty pattern once is stretch out the stitches you've just completed on your right needle. And we'll do that with the real yarn. You, you knit a few stitches, they're on your right needle, stretch them out before bringing the yarn behind them because then your float, which has to go behind them, will be looser. To avoid tangles, now what I mean by this is the balls of yarn might get tangled up off your work. I'm not so much talking about the back of your work, but this can help keep the back of your work smooth too. To avoid tangles, with two colors, designate one to be your over color and one to be your under. Or another way to think about that was one is going to be your top color and one is going to be your bottom color. I'll explain what that means, if I could spell over on the pictures. What I often will do with this is I will also think sky and I will think earth to think top and bottom, which often means if I'm given a choice, what I may do with my over and under, which will help me keep it straight, is to say the lighter of the two. The lighter of the two will be my, my over and the darker of the two will be my under, just to keep them straight, any way that I can remember. So as I mentioned in the intro, you can do this technique with one color in each hand, or both of them in one hand. There's a couple different things I'll say about that latter one. Whatever's easier for you, there's more than one way to do this. You should do what's comfortable for you, but I will mention Right now, nothing's probably comfortable if you've never tried this before. You need to develop muscle memory, so you may want to try some different ways. Now, we may not address this too much today, but I just wanted to point out, when the floats get really long, you'll find different answers to how long you want to let your floats get before you want to lock them down so they're not long and stringy or too tight and really pulling if you have, say, 10 stitches of one color before you hit your second color, your second color is floating over a really long gap. And so my general rule of thumb is about every four to five stitches, you want to lock your floats down. And that's twisting the, the two colors around each other. Again, that may deserve its own video. Um, the other thing I should have put here I'm going to add in is... Try not to lock colors down the same stitch in the same place on two rows. I should say two consecutive rows. This is going to interfere with that, but yeah, whatever. So if you have your floats, if you lock them in the same place on one row and another, you'll you'll see them. It'll it'll show up. It'll be wonky. That probably deserves its own video, not today. But know some of that going into it if you want to jump from this video into a super complicated pattern. You can do that, by the way. Totally okay. Let's take a look at what is going on here. Here's a bunch of color work where I have one, two, three rows. The row on the needle is different from the row underneath it. And what's going on behind it will be different too. 
tried to do some of this in the real life example that we'll be doing. But we have a, like a checkerboard stacked funky different pattern here. But what was just knit was one stitch of blue, one stitch of orange, two stitches of blue, four stitches of orange, and a stitch of blue. All right. So from the front, here's what it will look like. The fun thing about this video is going to be a lot of what happens is on the back. So we won't see it looking at the front. That's kind of the whole point. Now let's take a look at the front. I've exaggerated this greatly to show you the floats. If we were looking straight down on the, on this row of knitting, here's what we would see if it's done the way that I want to show y'all. We would have that first stitch of blue and then a stitch of orange. And then to get to the two stitches of blue, the blue is going to have to float behind that orange stitch. Now I should point out that because the blue is my darker, my blue is going to be the under and my orange, because it's lighter, is going to be my over in these examples. So the blue has to go behind this stitch that here's the float. Me. Tons of colors here. Here is a float. My blue float. Let's color him in. But he goes, he's, he's on the bottom. So that's my blue float. Now my orange, there's two blues here. The orange stitch did this one, the orange yarn did this one, and it has to float behind before it does its next stitch. And orange I've picked as the one that's going on top. So if you look down on it overhead, I want you to see where that would be underneath. So the orange one floats on top, but it floats behind these two stitches. And then again, four stitches of orange. So the blue has to float behind all of these stitches before it comes over here. Now it may not be hanging quite this loose in real life, but I really wanted you to see what's happening. If you were concerned, say you were using really chunky yarn and this float was going to be really long, you could decide maybe two stitches in to wrap. This would be a good place. Again, it wouldn't hang out so far, but this would be a good place to wrap your orange around. If you wanted to, I'm just going to take a little bit of color out there. I wouldn't wrap every two stitches. Usually I'm going to mark this as an optional wrap. I would wait until longer or else you might be wrapping an awful lot and that will twist your work. So that isn't visible at all. This would be a lock. Let's use the language I used before. And this is optional. You can just let it float behind there. On certain patterns, especially with fine yarn, floats can go longer. It's just, if you lock it down to the back, it may not suck in as much. It's your choice. Let's look. Now, if we flipped this needle around and you were looking at the back, so these stitches are now reversed from what was up here. Might feel a little wonky, but if we turned it around, here is an example of what you would see. We'd see the purl stitches on the back that would match the colors of the row underneath. So they would look a little different if we filled them in 
according to what we see above. Technically, the way these floats are though, they may cover up all the stitches and you may not even really see them. But here's the thing when we're talking about the blue is the one that goes underneath. We want it to travel underneath every time. And if we get our orange to travel over every time, then we get a really clean looking back. This comes from under, this comes from over. And you may be saying, but how do I do that? And I'm gonna say if we were doing it, I'm gonna show y'all how to do that. How to keep the blue down and the orange up and the blue down so that we don't have twists. The thing, if you always take it the same direction over, you would have a lot of twists and your yarn would be very tangled. So let's take a look at the next row. Now on a chart like this, I've done a chart video where you would always start because you're knitting across a row, you're knitting the stitches as they come to you. For a knit row on a chart, you would always start here and you would travel that way to read these stitches. So what would happen if I do my next row is I would knit an orange stitch and then I would knit two blue stitches and then since orange is my over row I'm gonna take this out we'll put him back in since orange is my over row I'm gonna pick up the yarn and make sure it comes over the blue yarn that I'm, I've just dropped here so that I can knit my next orange stitch. When I pick up this yarn, I wanna make sure I'm picking it up from underneath the orange yarn so that I can knit my next blue stitch. And then to knit my next orange stitch, I wanna make sure that that float goes over the blue yarn and I have two more blues, I want to pick that up, make sure it goes under the orange yarn to knit my last two blues. Let's add in here that this was the next row. That's how I would do that. Over, under, over, under. If you're doing that with one hand, you can move it. How you pick it up, the yarn will change that. If you're doing it with two hands, the motion of it, you want to put your yarn in different hands to help control your motion. Let's move to real yarn so we can see that. Okay, I've erased some of the boards, so all I'm leaving is the example of what we're going to do. And I have a sample I've knit here where it's two repeats. There's, there were nine stitches in my sample. And I've got 18 stitches here. Okay. So here's the back of my work. I don't have blue and orange. I have cream or a crew and a nice teal, but I have light and dark. That's the important thing. And if you look at the back side here, I have my floats. Okay. So, and they're mostly loose. And they're mostly going in the right direction. All right. So if I was going to do this row next, let me show you how I would do it if I was going to hold both strands in one hand. Now, the easiest way to do this <coughs> is to only hold one strand in your hand and pick up and drop. So I'm going to start with a light color. I'm going to go in. I could cross them. I don't have to. I don't think I'm going to though. So I'm just going to knit with my light color. And this will be loose because it's my other color who has no tension on him right now. 
but I knit with my cream. I'm going to drop him. I need to knit two with the blue. So I'm going to go in and when I pick up my yarn, I want to pick it up from underneath. I don't want to go over the top of my cream. Dark goes, darker goes from underneath. So I'm going to make sure that he's off to the side. I'm going to pick him up from underneath, not going over my cream, coming under my cream. So I'll pick him up and I will knit two stitches and then I can drop him. My cream should go over. So I'm going to pick this guy. I'm going to do one stitch by pulling him over the top. Now the next one is going to be my dark and he should come from under. Now I could also hold both strands with my finger in the middle. This is another thing I do if I want to do them both with this hand. And what I would do, actually, I'm remembering how I do this now. If I put it in this way from the back, over, under, then I can flip. He's going to come up from the underside. Remember, stretch out your stitches. If I flip back, he's over. If I flip this way, he came from under. And I can keep going. Now, if I want to do a strand in each hand, Here's what you want to do. You want to have the under color be in your left hand and the over color be in your right hand. So get your tension set up however you would like to with both hands. This, when you go to pick, it'll naturally come up from under. This, if you throw, will naturally go over. So let's try another repeat of this pattern starting here. I'm going to come over with my A crew. And then if I just come to get this, he's coming under. See, it's not crossing this guy. Under with my teal. And I am not the most fluid continental knitter, but it works. I would stretch these out to make sure that my next stitch, which is going to come over, I don't want to yank tight. I don't want to yank really tight with this because that is going to tighten all this up. I come over the top with my A-crew. I come under the bottom, if I actually can catch the stitch, with my teal. I come over the top and I can come under to do these. Again, I can come over. Notice how that's on top. It's over on top of this. This is still under. And then this one, just by being where it is, comes from under. And if I look at the back here, floats top and bottom. Some you can't even see. They kind of get buried in there, but they're nice and smooth. So that was my attempt to show y'all how to do some stranded color work. Now, the in real life version that we did may have whizzed through that kind of quickly. So if you need a follow up on one certain version of how to do that, I am happy to do an expansion pack on this. <laughs> Just let me know. For now, you know, if you like what you saw, subscribe, hit that bell so you see new videos from us. Give it a thumbs up at the very least if you can. Um, you can always request a one on one with me. Zoom is the best way to do that right now, especially if you're not local. Local people, we've started with masks to have outside appointments at the shop, but we are booked through till July right now. But you can always contact us about that. I hope this will give you confidence to try out some stranded color work patterns. They are.
the most fun. I really love them. It's really hard for me to say what technique I like the most because I re I love lace. I love cables. <laughs> I love Fair Isle. Um, I love stranded color work. I'm eyeing quite a few tops that have stranded color work in them. Caitlin Hunter is a wonderful pattern writer, writer for those kind of things. Jennifer Steingass is another one with the colored yoke, the pattern that's at the top. You can find sweaters that have the entire thing done in color work. And it, I find it fun because it keeps me entertained. It is a challenge, but every row is different. And so I sometimes get fancy patterns done faster because it's keeping my attention and I'm not getting bored. So contact us if you want some advice on that. If you don't hear from us from the comments, you can always contact, con, uh, contact us through the website that we have, through the online shop. Definitely reach out for, to us because we, we love our Sun Dragon community and if you're watching this video, you're already part of it. And I should probably let y'all go and enjoy your day, but say may your crafting be filled with joy and confidence. You can do this too. See y'all later. We miss you and we love you. You visited me earlier, but now we're snoozing again, huh? I feel like that is the nice, calm state of the kitty. Yes. Hi.